Hello, you're watching a lesson on monitoring vCloud Director. Now in this lesson, we'll be focusing pretty much strictly on the vCloud Director cell because we're monitoring kind of the events, the tasks, the performance of vCloud Director as a whole. And really the VCD cell or VCD server provides everything you're going to need in this lesson. So that's the focus. We're not going to be going into say like vCenter logs or the vCloud network and security appliance because really the job of the vCloud director cell is to kind of grab all that information for you and provide I hate to say single pane of glass but that's the concept is that you have one kind of repository for all this information as it relates to vCloud. So to begin with every good admin worth his salt or her salt will need to be able to know and inspect the logs that go on and this is really probably the least fun activity within kind of any IT job, you know, digging through the logs, grepping through the logs. Uh, it's kind of like hunting for buried treasure in, you know, a, a giant sandbox where you're looking for a penny. Uh, but it's a worthy skill and uh, somewhat kind of a lost skill. So we'll go over the different uh, logs that, that exist within vCloud Director and how to get to them. So the first part is tasks, and this is very similar to a vSphere environment um, in that tasks provide a way that you can see the overarching operational progress of what's going on within vCloud. So the example I typically use is a task would be something very general, like I'm driving to work today. I didn't tell you what car I took or when I left or what turns I took. I'm just letting you know I'm driving to work. And an example task in vCloud could be I'm building a virtual machine or a vApp. Or, you know, in this case, I've got an example photo of a task where I'm trying to create a network pool. So it doesn't give you the nitty gritty in a task view, but it does give you what was the operation that was trying to execute and the, the status of it. Uh, in this particular case, if you look at the details, it's telling you that uh, ensure the infrastructure is prepared in VSM, which is the vShield manager, which again, <laughs> the vShield name is going away, but it's saying that I didn't do something necessary for this action to happen. So I can read the details of this, you know, failed task and then remediate it. So it's very helpful. And when I get through this little section on the logs, we'll go through actual examples in the lab, but I want to give you a photo just to kind of kick things off in, in this particular piece. The next kind of other side of the coin are vCloud events. And again, this is similar. The, the, the same kind of structure exists in vSphere. Tasks and events, there's nothing really different. The difference is just focused on the fact that these are tasks and events specific to vCloud. So when I gave the example of driving the car being a task, the events may be I got in the car, I turned the key, I put my seatbelt on. That's a good one. Make sure to put your seatbelt on. <laughs> I backed out of the driveway. You know, all the very specific events that occur within a task. So I use the example create, start, and complete. Maybe you're building a V app. So first you're creating the V app, then you start building the V app, then it's complete. So it outlines all the different pieces that occur within a task. So they go, they go hand in hand very well. Events are a great way to dig into the nitty gritty. So maybe the task failed, but you can go through the events list and figure out where it failed. Maybe the create was successful, but it couldn't start the VApp for some reason. That's, a good, that's an example there. And in this case, the example that I give with the photo is uh, user logons. And so events are great for figuring out who's trying to log on and then based on that, who's successful and who's failed. So I try to log on as Joe Bob, and it's saying, you know, the, the user type of the event is a user, a logon event, and that it failed, you know, and it doesn't really give anything beyond that. It just status was failure. It didn't get on. We can assume his password was wrong, uh, but it may be that he doesn't have rights. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that this event may show a failure, and then we need to dig into the why behind it. So this is a good way to audit people trying to get in and out of your system. And then for actual hard logs that you can kind of wrap your arms around and, and extract and, and perhaps even give to VMware if you need tech support are the vCloud director logs themselves. These are actual files that are continuously updated and zipped uh, as they roll over, which is basically the act of we fill up a log file until it reaches a certain age or a certain size. Then vCloud will automatically zip it up, 
roll it, you know, kind of backwards in time and then start building a new text file so that the, the, the latest and greatest text file is always what it's currently writing to. And then you'll see a history of other text files that are now kind of archived, so to speak. So the path that you use to get to these logs is, is shown here. It's opt VMware vCloud dash director logs. And what I like to do, I'm, I'm a Windows guy. Uh, you could go directly onto the Red Hat Enterprise Linux of the vCloud cell and play with it. But I'm typically on a Windows box and I'm using WinSCP. It's this really easy to use free application that you can download. Just Google WinSCP and there's links to it all over the place. Uh, just don't get one with a virus on a scan at first, you know, unless you trust the download place. And this is just a way you can connect into vCloud Director's cell and grab the logs that you need. And there's all sorts of logs that are available. Here's kind of the major six uh, in that you've got the cell.log. Now the cell.log contains any console output. Now what does that mean? So if I were physically on the console of the vCloud Director's cell and I'm typing commands and it's giving me feedback, it's all recorded in cell.log. So if someone, you know, got a little crazy <laughs> and they're on your vCloud Director's cell and they type some some goofy commands or maybe they're doing something malicious, I hope not, you've got a log that would capture that. Now, I guess, you know, if they're already that far in, they could potentially also delete the log, but uh, one would hope that you've got a syslogger, you know, or something kind of scraping that log and then pulling it, or they're just on the cell and they weren't able to log in and it captures that as well. So anything on the console is captured of that log. There's also a vCloud container debug log. So if you have debug enabled, perhaps you're working with... Uh, with VMware on an issue. Any debug issues will show up here so you can help figure out what's what's causing the problem. There's also a vCloud container info log has all the issues that are going on. Think of it, you know, I list info warnings and errors are the major things that would be contained in there. So just kind of a good recap of what's what's going bonkers in your vCloud environment. Hopefully this is mostly filled with informational events and not warnings and errors, but uh, there it is. And then the VMware VCD watchdog log. And this is a cool one because it'll pretty much tell you every time VCD has been restarted. So if you see a bunch of entries in there, you know, maybe someone has put in a ticket and said, yeah, I keep losing access to my vCloud session uh, yet last night. And you come in in the morning, you can pop open that log. And if you see, you know, every hour or 30 minutes, you see an entry in that log, you know that vCloud was restarting over and over again. So it's a great way to figure out, okay, are, am I having crashes? Is it restarting? And that's a good way to kick off the troubleshooting process so that you can go in and say, okay, I know it was rebooting. Now I need to figure out why. And then diagnostics.log, another one where we're looking at specific diagnostical information. And this is this is something that typically is off unless, it, unless you're asked to enable it. Uh, so we, we typically aren't very interested in this log unless we're trying to solve a very specific issue. And again, usually you've engaged with tech support from VMware uh, and they've asked you to turn this on or they've turned it on for you. And then the last one has kind of a weird format because I'm trying to show it would be the year, month, and date dot request dot log. So it's going to vary depending on what day it is. And these are the logs going into Apache, which is the web service that's running for vCloud Director. So any of the request logs coming out of uh, to Apache would be listed in these logs. So let's get out of the presentation here. Let's go into the lab, and I will show you the tasks, events, and logs. Okay, so I've switched over to the vCloud Director interface that we've seen all throughout the course. Shouldn't be anything mysterious or exciting here. Uh, and we'll go into the tasks and events. And the neat thing about tasks and events is they exist both at a system level and an organizational level. So let's go into manage and monitor here at the system level, and we'll start there. So if I go into logs down here at the bottom, he's kind of lonely at the bottom. No one goes and checks the logs, second only to blocking tasks. But anyways, we'll click on logs, and there you go. There's tasks, and it's a little hard to see. My, my screen is kind of scrunchy here, but if I expand the tasks column, you can see here's all the tasks that are going on. And a lot of times they'll be really long because every virtual machine has one of these, you know, long kind of face roll GUID IDs at the end of it. But if you hover over it, like I'm showing here, a little kind of yellow box pops up and says, this is what I'm doing. It goes away after a little bit here. So I'll hover over another one. 
So start a connection to Virtual Central Chicago vCenter. Just letting you know that a task occurred where on this date it was connecting into vCenter. And that's probably because that's when I powered it on. Uh, I tend to power this thing off and on as needed. So uh, we've got a, a, a couple different entries that look pretty much the same because we're connecting into Virtual Center multiple times as I continue to goof around with VCD behind the scenes. If I then later go into events, here we can see all sorts of better information. And I wanted to give you, let me get this thing to go away. There we go. I wanted to give you an example of a failure here uh, in that I tried logging on as the administrator and, and put in the wrong password. So it says user administrator login failed. So these are great ways to figure out who's trying to log into the system and uh, what the failures are. Or if it was successful, you know, if they're able to log in, you can you can say, oh yeah, uh, I saw you log in successfully. I know that the issue that you had where you called me and said you couldn't log in is now resolved. That'd be an example. Um, here we go. Uh, the cell actually started and then failed over. So I had I had just a couple issues that were going on. If I click on it, uh, you can get even more details and you get kind of this uh, regurgitation of exactly what's going on. This would be helpful in case someone's trying to help you from VMware to troubleshoot it. Uh, in this case, it's success, so there, it's kind of a failover that was successful, so it's a good thing. Uh, but you get all sorts of really good nitty-gritty details at the system level from this view. Now, I'll switch over. Let me, let me pull up an organization here. I'm going to click on Organizations. I'm going to pull up Developers. So all I'm doing is just clicking on the name Developers. It's going to open this tab right here. And they kind of get similar stuff. You know, they, they get stuff pertinent to their environment. So if I go to Administration here, uh, we can see all sorts of information for them. Actually, I want to go to my cloud. I go to logs. Here at the bottom, it's the same kind of thing. Logs is always kind of towards the bottom. It's the least used section, or at least hopefully you're not having to go to the logs a lot. Uh, but same kind of uh, format. I'll go to tasks. You can see very different tasks. Not, they're not really repeated here because these are tasks just relevant to the organization. And this would be, if I were a, a, an org admin or someone that had access to the logs for this org, I would see just this. I wouldn't be able to go to the system tab. This, this tab wouldn't exist. But then I can see, okay, acquired screen ticket of virtual machine uh, VMA. That just means someone's opening the console. So uh, a screen ticket is fancy terminology for open console. And I know that uh, that was successful. It's in the organization developers. The owner of it was Joe Bob. And here's the time. So you can get really gritty details in it. Like, oh, okay. Joe Bob's looking at the console of the machine called VMA. Is that really relevant day to day? Probably you don't care. This is just, you know, kind of letting you know. But if there were a failure there, uh, it would be very important, very helpful if it said it failed. And then events, kind of similar. I believe I baked in a, a failure here just to, to show you. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Now this is the same kind of thing with my admin couldn't log in. Here's Joe Bob couldn't log in. So here's user Joe Bob was unable, unable to log in because uh, his login failed. So again, you really don't get the detail like, okay, why did it fail? Uh, was it a bad password? Was the account locked out? You know, what's the deal? But at least it gives you the idea, okay, I, I can start troubleshooting here because I know it's Joe Bob, it's this time. He, he wasn't able to log in, and, and it does validate a few things. It lets you know that the user can get this far, so maybe they're, they're calling you up and saying, yeah, I can't log in, and they're actually on, you know, Yahoo website or something. It's the complete wrong page. I mean, that, that happens. <laughs> so at least you know they're on the right page and that they know their username. And, and then, then the question really becomes, do they know their password, you know, potentially reset it, and uh, perhaps did you not do something right on your end? Did you not give them access, et cetera? Uh, so those are where the logs are. Let me switch over real quick, and I will pull up WinSCP, and we'll go into the physical logs. Okay, so I have uh, just a copy of WinSCP version 425 that I've downloaded off the internet. You can see the last time it was modified was 2009. So, I mean, this thing is kind of, it's just, it's just been kind of laying out in the internet for a long time. It doesn't really get any updates or anything, but it works, and it's, it's free, it's small, it's 1.6 1 meg, and you don't have to install it, which I like. So you literally just double click and bam, you're in, you're in WinSCP. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, so all you have to do is put the host name of your vCloud director server in there. So I'll put vcd.glacier.local. And the user account that I'm using is root. And my private password there. 
And that's pretty much it, um, other than we need to change this to SCP and log in. And there you go. You're now kind of doing a file browse of what's on that server. So on the left side, we've got my documents folder. I can change this to whatever I want. I can change it to desktop if I want. Um, and this is my computer. And on the right side, we've got the vCloud Director cell. And as you can see here, it has a different structure. We're currently logged into the root directory, which we don't want. We want to go to that opt VMware vCloud Director logs path. So let's back up. You click this double arrow with the, has a little arrow pointing up and it's a double dot. Double click that. And then we can go to opt, double click on VMware, vCloud Director, and then logs. There it is. It's an alphabetical order. Sometimes I have trouble finding the L. <laughs> so here we go. You got a long list, and this, this list will only get pretty much longer with more files as vCloud Director ages. Uh, there will be a point where you just really won't have any more logs as a quantity perspective because you'll notice here like debug log. I've got debug, uh, the current debug.log, which is a writable text file. And then the rest of it is debug, debug.log.1, .2, .3, .4, et cetera. So the way it works is log.9 is the oldest file. 8 is a little newer, all the way up to the current file. When this file fills up, it looks like at 10, 10, uh, 10,485,775 bytes-ish, uh, it fills up and then rolls to the next log. So when this one fills up, it will then become dot one. This will become dot two, dot three, et cetera. It'll roll the logs all the way down, and this dot nine will fall off and be deleted. So you've got ten, nine-ish logs all the way up to ten logs of data that rolls for you. That way it doesn't fill up the drive on there. And you can see this kind of this kind of standard follows for the container info log, uh, these JMX logs, et cetera. They all kind of do that. Uh, there's a few that don't necessarily do that. The cell.log that I talked about, the console output, let's open that up real quick. So I want to open it. I can just right click and choose open. And there we go. We get a really bad notepad file. Uh, notepad is probably the worst way you could to read these files. But when you click open, it does that by default. But I'm just going to show you the fact that here we've got, these are the, the console outputs that were going on. And I'm going to actually word wrap this just so you can see there's a lot of data that's hidden. This is, if I were looking at the screen, exactly what would be uh, shown to me. You can see this was kind of the, the data that was displayed on the console as it booted up. And then here it is. It's successful, ready to go. If I were to go on there and type some commands, you would see those commands. So that's how cell.log works. Another interesting log that I wanted to open real quick uh, was the watchdog down here. So we got the VMware VCD watchdog.log. I'll open that one up too. And you can see... That one looks a little better because all it's saying is that the VCD cell was, was started on uh, 4.5 at this time uh, and that uh, there was some info saying it started the cell as well. So the watchdog started and then the VMware VCD cell started. That's great. That's what we want. If I go into the other log um, right here, I'm actually just right clicking and clicking open. So we've got all sorts of information here where the log collection keeps restarting. So let me actually turn on the word wrap. So you got all these different collections going on over and over and over again. These are different times where the log collector has been started because I've been restarting the vCloud Director cell. The whole server itself has been restarted that many times. And unfortunately, just the view with Notepad is, is terrible. But uh, you can see here, here's a date here where the log collection agent was started right there. So that's one log entry. Here we got another one that it was started. And so I can get a picture based on these uh, log collection agents that, wow, this was started a lot of times. So this is every time I've rebooted the VCD cell. So it just gives you a, kind of a laundry list of every time I've booted it up. Notice the watchdog is just really interested in, okay, the server's online. When has, when has the service restarted? So the difference between the server restarting, the full actual virtual machine restarting, and just the watchdog noticing that the cell got restarted. They're different things. I just wanted to point out that difference. I've, I've had that come up, come up a few times, uh, and that's, that's pretty much it on that. So let's go back into the lesson, and we'll move right along. Okay, so now you know where all the logs are, and I'm, I'm sure it was a fun adventure going over all the logs. It's definitely, like I said, it's, it's my least favorite part of dealing with pretty much any system, but it's just a necessary evil. Let's go into something a lot more fun, and that's monitoring the resources. So understanding what's being consumed, how much you have left. I mean, this is probably a lot more day-to-day.
VMware has really made it really easy to see exactly what kind of resources are being consumed and remaining within the system. And this, this kind of lives for the provider VDC level, the virtual, or, or I'm sorry, the organizational VDC level, which they, they label virtual data centers. It, it's really e easy to see this kind of information. And they like to use these uh, kind of like progress bar looking uh, fillers for that. So within pretty much everything you can think of that is in the system of the org for your cloud resources, you can see consumption by clicking, you know, I, I grandiosely give it the, the title of the monitor button. It's literally, literally a button that says monitor. And when you click on it, it shows you information. So this one's pretty straightforward. Let's, let's go back into the lab. I'll show you a couple examples that are live showing the consumption of resources within vCloud Director. Okay, so we're back in the lab. Uh, I left it off with the developer's log area, so we will get out of that. We'll go back to system. Uh, so we'll look at, like I said, cloud resources is really uh, where we're looking for here. So if I go to the provider VDCs, I can see, okay, I've got a gold provider VDC that we made in earlier lessons. It's enabled, yada, yada. That doesn't help me. I want to see the monitoring. Oh, the monitor button. Click, and there you go. I mean, it's just, it's just really that easy. Let me, uh, oops, let me grab that and expand it a little bit. And it's a little harder when you when you don't have that many that much uh, real estate space on your screen here. So let me just try to shrink this a little bit. But you get the idea. Within here, you know, your boss could come by and say, "Hey, you know, how are we doing on processor?" And you can say, "Oh, well, we're using about a quarter of it." And if you hover over it, it gives you that nice little, "We're using five gigahertz. We have 21.39 gigahertz." which equates to 23.67%, but nobody talks like that. You're just going to say, oh, we're about a quarter filled, uh, so that you know processor, you're looking good. Memory, you're looking a little less good, I guess you could say. You're using almost half. So you'll know, uh, hey, you know, maybe 70% filled or 80% filled is your high water mark. And when you hit 80% or 70%, 70% is probably a better number uh, to start kicking off the order process to say, okay, I need to put in a request to get a PO cut because we've consumed enough resources that I'm now worried we can't provide elastic services to our clients or tenants. So th these are great ways to just get that really quick eyeball view at the provider level, you know, storage, allocation of your processors and, and memory, and allocation of your storage. So you kind of get, what am I actually using and what have I allocated? And notice these numbers don't match up because... Uh, I'm using 46% of memory, but I've allocated 62% because there's different models uh, on top of the provider VDC that consume the resources differently. So let's move down to organization VDCs and we'll kind of see that a little better because we have a reservation pool and an allocation pool. A reservation pool is going to reserve everything, whereas an allocation pool is going to take a percentage of what we need. So it's easier to see if I click monitor. Here we go. Here I've got a reservation pool where we've consumed um, 5 gigahertz of reserved capacity. So that 5 gigahertz is kind of locked in. Whereas for this one, uh, we've got a lot more information. All I'm doing is just hovering over it. I didn't mention that. But if I hover over the, the 3 gigahertz here, we'll, we'll see we've allocated 3 gigahertz of capacity and we reserved 0.75 gigahertz of capacity. So the allocation and the reservation don't match for this allocation pool because I've set a percentage of the reservation. We're not reserving all of it, just a piece. Whereas for this one, you notice there is no allocation. It's just what you're using out of the total reservation. There's no other piece to the pie. So that's kind of locked in. And then if you go back to the provider VDC, you can kind of match that up a little bit. So we've got, let's see, we've got eight gigahertz allocated. That makes sense. That's the five plus the three. And then over here, We've got 5.06 gigahertz used. That's the five that we reserved plus the, the minuscule amount that's actually being used by the other guy. If we go back to the organization here, uh, this guy is using uh, 0.75 of a gigahertz. It's, not, not, it's hardly using anything. Really, I don't think anything's even powered on because the public catalog, if you'll remember, has nothing actually running. So there, it's, it's zero actually used in this case. And nothing, nothing should ever really be powered on in the public catalog uh, organizational VDC. If you remember from an earlier lesson, the goal there is just to provide templates uh, for your vApp consumers. So you may have something powered on temporarily uh, just so you can configure it or, or tweak it or update it or whatnot. 
uh, but they won't be they won't be on for very long. So that's why I go for an allocation pool in that particular case. Now there's there's other stuff that you can monitor, not this one. Um, external networks they don't have a monitor button, but you can see kind of this this filler up progress bar showing how much of the pool is being used. Uh, so a lot of the stuff has this kind of this kind of gauge here of usage uh, without having the full on monitor button. But you kind of get an idea based on uh, the fact that some of them have the monitor button just because they need to split out manage from monitor and other ones have it there just because there's nothing really to manage at this point. You, you can kind of fit everything into one view for this perspective. So that's, that's really a lot of the day-to-day -day administration for monitoring these resources to make sure that they're not full um, for the provider VDCs. You're, gonna really, you're not going to have probably just one provider VDC. You're probably going to have a few of these. Uh, gold, silver, bronze being examples, or maybe test dev, uh, you know, maybe blades, racks, whatever. Uh, but this is going to give you a good idea of where you're at and when you need to you kind of place another order. The other thing I want to show you is if I were to go into the organization and I'm going to go to developers, I keep picking on developers because they actually have vApps. Uh, but if I go to administration for the developers, you get the same kind of view, but you lose the provider VDC level, it just as virtual data center here. We don't know specifically what provider VDC we're under, uh, is how, how it's doing rather I should say. We know we're on the gold VDC, but we don't know how that one's doing because that's masked from us. What we can do is monitor our organizational VDC uh, for developers, the developer OVDC. We can see how we're doing. So as an organization we can see you know, how am I doing as far as the storage consumption? Okay, I've got 500 gigs given to me, and I'm using 50 gig, roughly, which is roughly 10% used. So then you know as a, as a tenant of the cloud, do I need to order some more resources? Do I need to put in a request, you know, to my provider to get more? And subsequently, there may be some costs associated with that. I may have to pay more money, etc. So that's really it for monitoring the resources uh, for, the, for the cloud resources. Uh, this is a good day-to-day -day admin issue, or I should say an admin, you know, kind of concern. Uh, we'll, we'll move back into the lesson and, and complete it with blocking tasks. Okay, so blocking tasks. These are probably the, the most uh, curious piece to vCloud Director. Probably, I would say at this point, this day and age, probably the least understood and least used from like a, a simple vCloud perspective but also kind of one of the cooler features that are also pretty powerful. So let's just take a moment to talk about what a blocking task is and why you may want one. So first off, let's imagine that you have consumers of your cloud as we've built them in the previous lessons. You've got the developers, they go in, they request a VM, it builds it, or rather a vApp uh, that contains virtual machines, and it builds the vApp for them. And that's it. There's really nothing else to it. But you might want them to be able to submit the request, but not necessarily immediately get the vApp. You want maybe some approval process. I mean, that's a very common use case for a blocking task. So the ideal workflow in your mind may be the developer requests the vApp, some sort of manager level like their department manager, or maybe even the team lead for the development team, then looks over that request and says, do we really need this? Because there's limited space. You know, you're paying for X amount of space or it costs, you know, maybe it's costly. You want to control the cost. You want to control the resources. So that person ultimately has the yay or nay to approve or decline the virtual machine. Uh, and typically you want that to email the developer lead or the manager. Say, hey, you know, Joe Bob wants a vApp. Are you cool with this? And they can say, oh, absolutely. Joe Bob's cool guy. I like Joe Bob. Give him the vApp. Uh, or maybe it's the other guy, uh, Bob Sponge, and uh, he said, oh, no, Bob Sponge, you know, he didn't give me that coffee this morning, so no VF for Bob Sponge. That's obviously fictitious scenarios. It should be a lot more focused around uh, cost models and such. But the goal is you're, inter you're kind of injecting a decision point into the process. And then once they approve or decline, that human approval then triggers the actual action. Either they've declined it and it just kills off the task, or they approved it, and it's going to go ahead and move forward with the task. So that's what a blocking task is. It's basically, I've got a photo here showing that uh, in this particular case, I've checked the box for build new vApp. And when a build new vApp process is kicked off, it sends, uh, uh, vCloud Director sends a message to an AMPQP broker. Uh, so it's Advanced Message Queuing Protocol, or AMQP broker. 
this is kind of just a fancy way of saying I, I, I need your attention. Uh, I have a message here. I need you to answer it for me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit here on hold waiting to build the V app depending on your response. That's a really simple way of doing it. And this goes over a product that we're not going to dive into. It's out of scope for this course, but it's called vCenter Orchestrator. And this is where we can build processes where it'll basically say, I've got an AMP, uh, an AMQP broker, sent me a message, what do I do with it? And VCO or vCenter Orchestrator can say, oh, this is exactly what you need to do. Send the email off to this guy, uh, you know, make sure the manager approves it. If it's Bob Sponge, tell him no, that kind of stuff. And then comes back and tells vCloud Director, here's my decision based on what the human said to do. So let's switch over to the lab and I'll show you where you can enable these blocking tasks. Okay, so I've switched back over to vCloud. Let's get out of the developers organization because that's not really what we're interested in right now. And we'll go to the system, administration, and extensibility. So that's where it's set up. I believe in an older version it might have said blocking tasks here somewhere. I can't remember exactly, but it's hidden underneath extensibility, and then you've got the settings for extensibility and the blocking tasks themselves. Uh, so the settings is where you would set up kind of some details around blocking tasks and where the AMQP broker would be at. Uh, so here we got default blocking task timeout is five days. That means I'm gonna send a, I'm gonna send the message out saying that I have a blocking task. And after five days, if I don't get an answer back, I'm going to abort the action. So if the guy said, you know, Bob Sponge requests a vApp, it sends out the request, it initiates the blocking task. Five days later, if he never got a response back, it would just decline his um, request for the vApp. Now you could just have it set to like resume, and maybe after, well, seconds seems a little slow or too fast, but you could say after 60 minutes, if I don't get a response back, to go ahead and do it. That may be an option just because you don't want to hold the, the gears of progress. Uh, but it's really up to you. And like I said, it goes to seconds all the way to days. You know, you could really have it do uh, an abort, resume, or fail. Uh, and the difference being abort would just, you know, kind of kill kill off the blocking task. Resume would just move forward with the, the next step. And fail would actually, no, it just, it just failed off. Uh, uh, it is basically now an event showing failure. And we can scroll down here. You get a lot of options here. Uh, a lot of this is kind of out of scope for this particular course, but I just wanted to show you uh, this is where you set it. Basically, you could say, I want to notify AMQP about everything, even stuff that's not, you know, not necessarily blocking. And then you'd set up the broker information here. So uh, if, you were, if you had an AMQP server somewhere, you would point to it, give it the port, the exchange, all that good stuff. Really what I wanted to show you if we scroll up is if I go to blocking tasks here, this is where you can choose what should be included, what, what, should, what tasks should be enabled for blocking. And so I chose uh, vApp lifecycle, that's where I got the photo from. Actually, I chose, uh, um, where'd it go? Build new vApp, here it is. Uh, instantiate vApp from template, sounds fancy. So build new vApp is I'm trying to build a net new vApp. It doesn't exist uh, in any other form. Instantiate vApp from template is a really, a really awesome way of saying I'm going to deploy a vApp from a template. So I'm going to take that template, I'm going to then turn it into a vApp into my, my cloud. Uh, so I don't know why they use such fancy term. Maybe, the, uh, maybe there wasn't any other cool other way to say that, but that's, the, that's kind of the verbiage behind it there. And there's all sorts of stuff. You could have it you know, do a blocking task, uh, whoop, getting a little squirrely there, when you're trying to... Uh, power cycle a vapp or you know start a vapp whatever there's all sorts of there's all sorts of stuff instead of making a blocking task to upgrade a virtual machine hardware version you might want to just uh, not give the person permission to do that uh, but if you found some reason to have a blocking task for that maybe you just want to have it send maybe it just sends out a blocking task so that it fires off an email to people but it still lets the person do it doesn't necessarily have to be a decision point you know, whatever it needs to be, you know, you could have it firing off uh, other workflows. So maybe when the person upgrades the virtual machine hardware version, it kicks off uh, an AMQP message that says, okay, I want to fire off this other workflow that in parallel, you know, sends off and alerts everybody or powers off the VM or whatever it needs to be. Uh, but that's where that's, that's where blocking tests are contained, uh, both the settings and the checkboxes. So this pretty much wraps up the lesson on monitoring vCloud Director. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.